like to start with uh, the UAE say document verification. Uh, what's the requirements that they have given to Nigerians for visa application? And from their website, it reads, the UAE's document verification website now requires application to pay a non-refundable application fee of 640,000 Naira, a 300% hike previous fees. And also wants Nigerians to show $10,000 account balance. Now, uh, Marzi Austin, we don't know what happened that UAE suddenly hiked the visa price up to this amount that is non-refundable. Are you hearing me? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm All right. You. And uh, the, if you apply for, if you are applying for UAE visa, you must have $10,000 in your account balance. And you know that this money that you pay, 640000 Naira, is a non-refundable fee. So what happened? What suddenly happened? Ah, uh, okay. Um, I want to say thank you once again. And uh, our technical director, Mazen who is on the background doing incredibly well for the success of this uh, program and this platform. Maz, I want to thank you. Uh, you know, the issue, the Im immigration uh, con con uh, conflict between Nigeria and the United Arab Emirates, uh, also known as UAE, days this time the challenge has been was there before was there during Buhari's time and uh, it was unresolved then it uh, spilled over to the current administration or should I say current regime but there are certain things to look on uh, because it's purely a diplomatic issue. We, the first question we should ask ourselves is what actually is the status of the Nigerian state? How respect, respected is Nigeria? What is the reputation status of the Nigerian state? You know, because people come up and say the end of Africa, people come up and uh, give themselves some kind of titles of hope, so to say. But reality always contradicts those, uh, you know, those efforts to encourage oneself negatively. Because in this part of the world, is, I'm talking about Nigeria, people tend to encourage themselves even when they are doing progressively bad. They want to say, let us keep hope alive. No, 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 you don't keep low hope alive in such situations. If UAE could handle Nigerian states in such manner since Buhari's era. What that shows you is that Nigeria does not have any respect amongst committee of nations. Ask yourself, can UAE handle South Africa this way? Can Egypt be handled this way? Can Morocco be handled this way? Even Burkina Faso. No, in principle, every country shares the same status. But let's just go beyond that. Comparatively speaking, Nigeria always, you know, presents herself as a giant of Africa. Why is giant of Africa being rubbish, being mesmerized by UAE? The answer is simple. Countries rate you not by the title you give yourself. 
the respect you get on international corridors is not based on the title you give. Countries look at certain indices internally to understand if you merit what you say you are. You cannot just come and say you're a giant of Africa, that you must be a special. Nobody hears that trash. You must still work it. So UAE is handling Nigeria the way it is handling Nigeria simply because Nigeria was not in before like the Arab Emirates. And you must also understand that the reason why they keep on putting up a stringent immigration laws against the Nigerian state is because they know you need them more than they need you. Because if they need you more than you need them, they will soften the immigration policies to accommodate you. But because they understand that there are mass exodus of Nigerians seeking for survival, because the internal policy has failed, the domestic political system has collapsed. So every country is just tightening her doors. Not, it's not a continental issue. They are not putting this to African countries. They are exclusively making this policy for the Nigerian state. And somebody will come up and say, uh, people are not, Nigerians are not speaking well about Nigeria. That is rubbish. If you like speaking well, when certain practical and expected indices are not compatible, nobody will respect you. Nobody will respect you. Because, you know, those in the corridor of power have this, this, should I say, uh, confusing techniques of saying everybody should, should speak well about Nigeria so that Nigeria will respect. That is rubbish. Whether you speak well or not, what committee of nations look at? They look at your capability. How heavy are your citizens? What is the level of job you have created for your citizens? The level of patriotism, as a matter of fact, patriotism comes out when the society betters your life. You cannot be patriotic in a destructive society. So these are some of the things that are playing out. So you really cannot respect Nigeria because you must respect yourself before another party can respect you. That is the principle of respect. All right, that is thank so you. Yeah. Okay. Is, 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 this hike, is this hike limited to Nigerians alone? This price hike. Limited. Let me tell you, it's limited to Nigerians alone. If you, if you, sorry to say this, a lot of Nigerians today, including the so called uh, social media influencer, most of People you know, notable Nigerians, are secretly buying citizenship of other African countries. One that you cannot, you might not understand the level of deterioration the country is. You cannot understand how dead the country is. You know, people tend not to, when you listen to uh, some, so, some so called, uh, should I say, uh, fellows. Like uh, Onunuga, whatever it's called, the jo journalist. I I'm sorry to say, people give him the name journalist. But the truth is, a lot of Nigerians, including the, her politicians, are buying citizenship of other African countries. You cannot understand how it works. You cannot understand how they are abandoning the Nigerian identity. And hypocritically keep on saying those of us who are asking for total dissolution of this entity, they are trying a way to identify with that we are doing the wrong thing. That's the level of hypocrisy in Nigeria. Tulubu, who is the president, we know he has a, one of the, it was alleged he has one of the African countries. Citizenship, Guinea, I think uh, either Guinea Conakry or one of the Guinea. And if you also take it down, you find out that even your senators must have acquired Western or other African countries' citizenship in order to lay hold to their passport. 
Because the, the name, the identity, even you mentioning Nigeria on the borders, whether on the international airport borders, whether on the sea borders, whichever border, you are seen as a criminal. But let me tell you something. The politician would want to tell you that those who are painting the name of Nigerian blacks are those who are smuggling drugs, who are doing uh, internet force, uh, internet force and all the rest of them. I don't support those things. But the truth remains, those these countries are not majorly. They are not relating with you because of the number of your citizens that are carrying drugs or your, the number of your citizens involved in internet fraud. They assess you, they give you respect on the quality of leadership you have. Because presidents interact with other presidents. They don't interact with ordinary citizens who are involved in uh, drug dealing. They don't have time. They cannot be that condescending to get to that level. They relate at leadership level. And what they see you is the quality of leadership you have presented. So this is exclusively for Nigeria. It's not a continental policy. It's not a policy that is targeted at African sub-region or regional level. It is strictly for Nigeria. And for those of you who still make noise and say they are proud of being Nigeria, shame to you. Because as, as small as UAE, UAE is dealing with the self acclaimed event of Africa. Isn't that shame? Isn't that disgraceful? That a country who, who, who has asked that self presentation as a giant of Africa is being dealt with by a minor country in Asia, or should I say, a minor country in the Middle East. You can see. So tell me why Africans will be proud of Nigeria when Nigeria is being flogged on the immigration level by a smaller country like UAE. Tell me how why South Africa should respect Nigeria. Tell me why Ghana should respect Nigeria. Ghanaian passport is still pre visa to, 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 to UAE, if I'm not mistaken. The same way to other countries. And you can see self acclaimed giant is business my right. And people are telling you you must not discuss this. People are saying you must not even beam a satellite on that. That is self destruction. So it's strictly for Nigeria, it's not a continental issue. Yes. And what you said just reminded me of what uh, happened between uh, the president of a uh, South Africa, Cyril Raposa, and the president of a uh, Nigeria, President Ahmed Tinubu. What happened or what transpired on the day of the inauguration? As we are just saying, or uh, as we are talking, the picture just came to my mind, and that is a big slap and shame on Nigeria. And uh, again, when you talked about people who pretend that Nigeria is better or that Nigerians don't speak good about Nigeria, that reminds me of, um, uh, I will say, a friend. I will say a friend that one day I was telling him about Nigeria and comparing Nigeria with other countries. And he got flared up that why should I be speaking bad about Nigeria? You know, he felt so bad. And because what brought about it, he said he wanted to travel back to Nigeria. So I was like, why are you going to Nigeria? What I was so I said that he said no, that Nigeria is a better place. And I asked him for how many years have you left Nigeria? Do you know he auctioned his properties and he went back to Nigeria? He went back to Nigeria in February. But could you believe that for two months now he's back? He can't cope in Nigeria. But this was a person who was so angry that, according to him, why should I be speaking bad about Nigeria? They call speaking truth. They call it speaking bad because the truth yeah, that, comes. That is the problem. That is why the country called Nigeria can never progress. Because they are an average Nigerian is inimical to truth. He detests truth. 
he abhors truth. He does not want you to sell a truth. It's at the level of official level. That is how bad it is. And let me tell you, for those of you who care to know, there is no country that does not give a harsh review of herself. If you listen to people in UK recently, they did a lecture, they expressed their dissatisfaction with the past regime. Before the opportunity of going to election and decide, they first of all used every medium to express their dissatisfaction. You can see what is going on in Germany. The rightists are taking over. People are expressing their dissatisfaction with the uh, current regime in Germany. You see, but in this part of the world called Nigeria, people always tell you, don't review anything. Even though lives have been wasted like you can see the level of missing people, people are missing everything. Nobody is talking about that. And nobody wants you to talk about that. People say, no, 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 no. It's better we just move on. Move on on negativity advancing on retrogression. So, when you find yourself in such country, whatever you desire most should not go outside the path that you go to get you out of such country. And that's the, that, is, that is a replicant representation of the Nigerian state. Where you have is a, is a form of advanced hypocrites. He's penning them, but nobody wants to stop. He's destroying them. They pretend until then, when it gets to a point of no return. Instead of them to take responsibility of their actions and their inaction, you see them trying to blame someone else. That is, that is how horrible the people are. You know, sometimes I, I, I People might say the white sounds so racist in using some descriptive measures to talk about Nigerians. But it is mess. They are very hard. Sometimes I wonder if they are lower species of human race. Because it is absolutely horrible to say what they do. And Mas, do you think that this uh, hike and this, uh, don't you think that more Nigerians will fall victim of scamming since this fee is non-refundable that they can, you know, as they can, that people will be applying and applying and applying and at the end they won't even issue them the visa? Well, the first question you should ask yourself is, because you, we, are, we are discussing the secondary, not the primary. We are discussing the secondary. When you're talking about people will be uh, defrauded, people will not be, you know, given the appropriate or measurable services which they paid for. You are talking about the secondary issue. Ask yourself a question. Do these people even want you to come in in the first place? If they want you to come in, they will, they will soften the process. They are giving the stringent process because they don't want you. And why is it they don't want you? Because they know that you are coming from a failed society. Mm. If you go to UAE today, for those of I know some, some, some persons are listening from that part of the world. If you go to UAE today, I have some, some persons in UAE. Other African nationals don't have issue of jobs giving a job permit, they don't have that issue. If you come to UAE, people from Bangladesh, Pakistan, India are in UAE. They also have their own social menaces they are, you know, constituting in UAE, United Arab Emirates. But why is it that the UAE's government have never used such a stringent measure on them, on people of Pakistan, on people of India, on people of Bangladesh, other African nationals? It's simple. 
they know that if they act, they will get a more counter action from this country. Because, for instance, you have a high trade. Is a trading partner with India. The same way to Pakistan, the same way to Bangladesh, and the same way to other African countries. And apart from that, they also understand the zero tolerance of leadership in this country if they should take such action. But in the case of Nigeria, what are the ambassadors doing there? The ambassadors will even endorse to sell away their people. Do the ambassadors in Nigeria? Do Nigerian ambassadors or the whosoever the diplomatic community in the UAE, do they even know what Nigerian interest is all about? They don't know. In fact, when you go there, what you see is a tribal ethnic sentiment. They export ethnic sentiment. When issues are rising, they say, no, it's the evil man that is causing it. Uh, no, it's the Yoruba man. If it's, that, if it's a Yoruba ambassador in UAE, he wants to you know, create the impression that it is the Igbos. If it is Aosa, he wants to create the impression that it is the Yorubas and the Igbos. So tell me, such society where their foreign mission is discussing ethnic, their ethnic issue at international level, tell me how those countries will take you serious. Because when we talk about this, people tend to, you know, cut it from the rooftop. Nigeria is fundamentally destroyed, not by the ordinary citizens, but by the politicians. Not by the men and women who are trading on the street. Those who destroy the image of Nigeria domestically and internationally are the politicians, are the leaders, people they call their leaders. Is it not Nigerian leaders that went to Ethiopia and begged Ethiopia to help them and scam Nigerians? By telling it to be, help us and paint a fake aircraft. Mm. Few days, just paint it. We'll fly it to Nigeria, and Nigeria will make noise, thinking we have initiated national career. And tell me tomorrow, you expect Ethiopian government to respect Nigerians in Ethiopia? They know that you are being represented by the worst criminals in this war. You are being represented by idiots. Who do not love the country? They have a zero patriotism. Are you telling me that Ethiopian president had the opportunity to deal with a, a drug baron? No. Or had the opportunity to deal with uh, the internet fraudster? No. He had the opportunity to meet the minister for aviation, who was endorsed by the president to go for that trip. Buhari cannot claim he was not aware of that trip. Then you tell me tomorrow, the same people will tell you, no, it is those people who are demarcating, uh, it is IPOB that is demarcating Nigeria. It's IPOB that is destroying the image of Nigeria. That is nonsense. The people who are destroying Nigeria, want to, the only thing IPOB is helping them to do is to help them internationalize and export their idiocy where it could not reach. That is exactly what IPOB is doing. But who are producing the destructive chemicals? It is them. What IPOB does is to help them and market it. Because a man cannot be destroying and you say you want to kill. No, 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 no. If a landlord wants to destroy his house, help him to destroy it. Because if your landlord says he wants to destroy his house and your building, a tenant does not plant flowers. So let us understand it. Let us understand it. Because when you look, look at these issues without understanding, you make a whole lot of blunders. Countries do not rate you at, by individual portrays. They rate you by leadership portraits. When you have chiefs as your leaders, those countries will relate with you. As I say, chief, no matter how, how religious you appear to be. Because and they're not dealing with your leaders. They know what your leader, they value, they are what. That is what I have to say. You know, as you are saying, as you were talking about being patriotic, what happened in Kenya 
just came to my mind how the Kenya President William Ruto dismissed the security agencies that shot at protesters, and not just that alone. I was thinking that what happened in Kenya or what the, the Kenya police chief did have also positioned Kenya to more to, to a country with integrity. I, I want to read out the, the words of uh, Jeff, Jeffet Kumi as he resigned because of Kenya protest. I want to read it out. So we can see, we can understand what you mean by Nigeria not just being destroyed by ordinary citizens, but by our leaders or Nigerian politicians. Let us listen to the words of the Kenya former police chief, Jeffet Kumi. He says, According to Kenya Constitution 2010, Article 1, sub Article 1 says, Sovereign power belongs to the people and shall be exercised in accordance with the Constitution. Today, I tender my resignation as a cabinet secretary in the government of Kenya. I want to offer my heartfelt apology to the people of Kenya for the greed, high-handedness, selfishness, arrogance, nepotism, tribalism, and all the bad things we have done to you in the past two years. When we came to power, we called ourselves shareholders and decided that most Kenyans are not part of the state and does not have any human rights. We went ahead to receive bribes from all over the world, but most especially from Dubai. We bought very expensive washes some as expensive as 1 million Kenya chillings, equivalent in dollars. We bought over 150,000 chillings, and we make sure citizens don't know how expensive we have become. In a country where poor families cannot pay their children's school fees, we were wallowing in luxury. I want to sincerely apologize and want to say today that I want to give out all the bribes that I have received from the last two years. All the practice that I have now, which can be traced back to all the bribes that I have received for the last two years, will be submitted tomorrow early in the morning. Should I get the chance to serve people of Kenya again, I will stop the greed. I will stop the arrogance. And most importantly, I will be accountable to the people of Kenya. And he said more, but I want to stop here. What picture are you having that Kenya has just painted to the world in this their unrest? Well, um, uh, for me, uh, this is my personal view. Uh, I don't, in most cases, I don't uh, give a narrative from mainstream perspective because I'm on the opposite, you know. I want to talk contrary to you know, popular way of pushing certain things. 
Uh, William Ruto, I have my reservation in his personality, in his integrity, earlier before now, when he was uh, vice to you know, Kenyatta, the former uh, prime minister of Kenya. I, I know Ruto, I have read extensively or to an extent uh, about the person of Ruto and uh, some dirty dealings, you know, his character and everything about him. So I don't also expect him to do well for the people of Kenya in the first place because of uh, his shady dealings and his, uh, you know, deepness in terms of relationship with the West. So invariably, I don't have confidence in Ruto. So uh, progressively, you know, progressively, he got into the full, you know, piloting of the government of Kenya, and subsequently we start we, we started seeing his attempt to put up austerity measures, you know, stiffen the people of Kenya who were previously suffering, you know, while living in ostentatious lifestyles and luxury, you know, just the way uh, you read out by one of the former members of his government. One thing we should understand that happened in Kenya is a courage, courage by the people. The people set aside their ethnics, ethnicity, religious differences, you know, ideological divides, and championed a common cause for their own benefit. That is what we call courage. That is what we call consciousness. So what the Kenya people taught Africa, I read somebody in, I think, Deputy Speaker of Nigerian House of Representatives talking that uh, Kenya, Kenya is not Nigeria. That is how horrible some people mindset is. It doesn't matter where good examples are emanating from. What is most important is for people to learn. It's for people to learn. So the Kenyans have proven to Africans that people can still be courageous, confront the state, a suppressive state against attempt to destroy the citizenry. That's exactly what the Kenyans have shown to us. Was there high-handedness? Yes, the state unleashed terror on Kenya. Ruto's government unleashed terror on Kenya. Did they resist? Yes, they resisted and prevailed. But let me tell you, Luton might think uh, he's smart by using other people to keep his government and all this. The truth remains that there are still agitation for panel of inquiry over those that were killed. Nobody knows where that is going to end. Anger is still in Kenya because people are no longer talking about the policy that, you know, uh, Triggered the, the protest. People are now talking about what of those people that were killed? Were they going to be allowed to die like that? And that is another state of national anger that is, you know, um, coming up. So Kenya people did a very good job by proving to the continent at large that people can still stand up set aside their differences, their religious affiliation, their ethnic device, and fight their common enemy, which is the leadership that is exploiting and undermining the well-being of the Kenyan people. That is it. I will digress a bit. 
we are talking about people setting aside their ethnic differences and religious belief. And in this struggle in IPOB, we saw the discussions of religion where it took IPOB today. And some people till now don't deem it fit or necessary for religious beliefs to be dropped or not seen as the targeted goal of IPOB movements. Do you still see any reasons why that discussion and anybody that is still dwelling on that discussion, do you see any reasons why it should be stopped? Irrespective well, of what you believe in. Well, um, I discussed extensively on that to some people on private level. You know, I, I say, listen, in this struggle, um, for the years I've been in this struggle, I have defined my area of interest. I'm not just defining an area of interest for myself. I have also communicated that out as much as I can. And what are the areas of my area of interest? Diplomatic development, global politics, and in some cases, internal political development. I passionately love to talk about them. Now, it is a very vast environment because every time political developments are coming on, diplomatic enlargements are coming on, internal political developments are coming on. Just as, as I speak to you now, Joe Biden just announced that he's not going to contest the election again. It's a breaking news. But that is by the way. Now, we have also seen people in this struggle who extensively measure on religious teaching. There's nothing bad about it. We have also seen people who talked about other areas, health. We have seen people who also talked about relief, uh, agriculture. There's nothing bad about it. Now, what we saw of recent was people abandoning areas they were known for and start talking a topic they have no impact much information about. I, it turns out to be a toxic because any day you want to extensively discuss a topic you don't have knowledge, you are deformed at, you will constitute a nuisance. And that is exactly what is going on. That is exactly what is happening. Most of our so-called media world lack any other thing to talk. So whatever is available, hence the, the desirability is not available. The available turns out to be the desirability. That's exactly what is happening. Most of them, they talk religion issue, not because they even have anything to talk about it, but because, oh, it seems as if nothing we can talk again. No? It seems as if we don't know what to keep our followers going. Let us now dampen to religion. And they, you see them messing up the whole thing. You see them disgracing themselves. You see them turning to users. So this is a human factor. Take note of that, which you can see in everywhere. But it is also important to rebook where necessary. Because if you let it go that way, you know, one bad thing about negative trend is that it keep on going, going, going on to a point where remedies cannot be applied. So most of us who have, you know, who tend to be talking about religion, religion, is because they don't have any topic to talk. So they dump. Then they, we have also some certain individuals who are also teaching, exposing constructively take note of that, not disruptive on that area. We, we give them kudos. We give them kudos. 
But let me say this, summarily on this. Anything you're talking about this, anything you're talking about in this problem, that deepens division, whether religion, whether political to, uh, topic, whether economic topic, whether social topic, anything you're discussing that deepens division amongst us is destructive. But anything you're talking that is enhancing cohesion, enhancing commonality, is a good thing to do. So most of these guys who are talking, because they are stupid, they lack knowledge, they are they are too irrational to say what they list. You see them deepening divisiveness. No, they are they are not consciously doing it because. They are not even unconscious of what they are doing. They are just talking because however people they work. If they are conscious, they should know that every topic we are talking should be for the edification, for the enhancement of courage, not scattering us. That is my contribution. This is a wonderful submission you have made because this is what every IPOB member with integrity and who is for this struggle when you listen to them to the voice of reasoning they always say the same thing i thank you so much for highlighting that now back to kenya and nigeria the former chief when he was uh, reading out his uh, resignation uh, letter he said that all sovereign power belongs to people. All sovereign power belongs to people. I want to ask if this sovereign power that belongs to people, if Nigerian politicians understand it, that sovereign power belongs to people. But as you are answering that, or before you answer that, I will want us to look at the word, or you highlight the word sovereignty before talking about sovereign power to the people. Well, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. There is no part of the world, not even United States, where the power has belonged to the people. I mean, the leadership. Take note, there has never been any part of the world where the leaders allow the people to exercise their power without the people, first of all, understanding the power in their possession. Not even the United States. Even to tomorrow, the powers that be in the United States are doing everything to make sure that the people are not aware of the concept of sovereignty belongs to the people, belonging to the people. In Britain, is also happening. In France, is also happening. So if anybody comes up tomorrow and says, uh, power belongs to the people, that can only happen when the people are aware when the people are informed. And that is why every autocratic government fights any channel that wants to inform the people. That's exactly what IPOB is facing today. The, the challenge, the confrontation IPOB is experiencing today is because IPOB is conscientizing the people. And no country allows that. No dictator allows that. No destructive society allows that. Because when you open the eyes of the people, the people rise and demote their oppressors. You can see what is happening. Let me give you a clear instance. If you look at Nigeria, for instance, from a, a larger scale, in East today, there tend to be certain revolution. There tend to be a kind of review of certain moves. In Aba today, we are having a kind of a reform electricity system. In Imo today, 
there is a kind of bilateral agreement between another electricity generating company or rash electricity company. You know, why are you seeing some of this? It's because these guys are hearing the voice of our people. So why are, why is our people having both to speak? Because they are being conscientized. The awareness was extended to them by the movement. But you don't have such a thing in the Yoruba land. They don't have it in Hausa land. Because they have, they have never been privileged to have a platform that creates the awareness to them. So these are some of the things you see. If anybody tells you that uh, the, the, the sovereignty belongs to the people, that might be at a theoretical level. But practically, that can only happen when the people are conscientized, when the people are aware, when the people are informed of how powerful they are. Anything outside that is just a theoretical framework. That's all I have to say. All right. Thank you so much. Let's look at what is uh, bringing up in Nigeria. We know that in this uh, present administration, protest has been planned and the protest failed. Not just that that protest failed, because some parts, like some, some parts in the West and North, carried out that protest. But before that, IPOB issued a press statement that no Iba nationality should participate in that protest. They issued that press statement around February 2024. Now, the protest failed. And I want to ask, why do you think that IPOB issued such press statement that no Igbo nationality should participate in that protest? And why do you think that that protest failed? Well, um, I, I I don't know the particular protest you're talking about because the one I know is the one. The that protest, the protest, the protest against a uh, Tinubu's uh, hardship, against hardship, protest against I hardship. That, the one that they planned previously, not the present one they are planning. Okay, I don't know about that one anyway, but um, to the best of my knowledge, um, uh, the one that the. I, they have given a whole lot of media attention is the upcoming one on August. But let's also look at why the leadership uh, took a position that uh, no Igbo national should uh, identify with that word. Yeah. So, first of all, you see, when people lack history, when people decides to recycle history, they live to suffer it eventually. One of those things we, the leadership have upheld extremely, uh, which is uh, really, really, really appreciable to them, uh, to every member of the Directorate of State, is the, the ability to make analysis. You see, some idiot will come and talk, not thinking. People, people are quick to talk open their mouth and talk without thinking. Ask yourself a question. Why is it that all over the world, countries have places like Department of State, places like Office of Foreign Affairs, and not just what do those guys do that? They are in those places. What do people do in places like that? They do extensive analysis. You see, any policy that is not born out of extensive analysis will definitely fall. If it doesn't fall, it will be backfiring, destructively backfiring. And what 
it is the leadership thing. Most people, some of you see, sometimes you listen to people, uh, leadership is not fast in action. You, when you start, when you start handling a national interest, the interest of a people, you don't consider, so to say, in some certain factors. You don't, you don't, the opinion of, you know, auto thinkers who believe that everything is just the way it, it enters their brain, then they vomit it. You, you stop those childish behavior. And you start coupling your policy. Your policy should be born out of extensive analysis. And how does those analysis, what are the raw materials for analysis? You look at the history. You look at history. So, so time we did this, what was the result? If we do it today, what is the possible result? What is the gap of yesterday we do it and today? You must consider all those factors. And guess what? Leadership came up and said, we are not interested, owing to the fact that any protest is always immobilized. In fact, even when IPOB have distanced herself, some idiots like uh, Onunu Gao, I don't know the man name, called the journalist. Deji. Huh? Someone like Deji. Good, I don't, I, I can't remember his exact name. And some ethnic bigotries within Asoro, they are also trying to find a way to give the narrative that is P2B and IPOB that organize it. Even when IPOB have distanced, have disassociated and advised the Igbo nation against that. You know, our people do not understand something, and it's, it's very, very important with saying it. Most of the things you see leadership say is born out of intelligence sharing. Because if you, if the leadership of this struggle, as at this time, have not been able to be listening, having an ear within the enemy, that means we are not serious. We should, we should all pack and go home. If as at this time, this over a decade, over 10 years, this struggle has been. If we have not developed the capacity, the capability to be listening to what is happening now, so when I mean listening, I'm not talking about speculating information, I'm talking concrete information, having a first class, a verifiable information. If we have not evolved to that point, I want to sincerely say we are jokers. And there's no need of us deceiving ourselves. We should go home and rest. So most of the things the leadership advises on is based on intelligence. Based on intelligence. But guess what? Because we have some idiots amongst us, irrational people, irrespective of their age. Some people are old but stupid. When you give up those earlier warning, earlier warnings, you see them saying, no, no, we want to, no, no, why are you saying it? We, we, we have not seen evidence of that. Then when the evidence start coming out, trust them. Because a stupid man finds it difficult to apologize for his mistake. You will see them saying, no, we are sorry. For instance, I'm not digressing. The leadership got the intelligence that there are a concerting effort to poison us through GMO, genetically modified foods. The leadership got the information. The leadership cannot come and start telling you country A gave them the intel, country B, or this person. No, 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 no. You don't do that. There is principle of confidentiality. If you more should be given to you, you should be able to have confidence. You know, secrecy. You should have a level of confidentiality to maintain. If other further information should be handed over to you. And the leadership came and said, and campaign extensively on agro revolution in our land. Some idiots who are dead in breath said, oh, they have abandoned the struggle. They are not talking about agriculture. They have lost focus. Leadership DOS they are confused. Did just, it didn't take less than three months. We start hearing Tellamis. 
The gate came and started flooding everywhere with GMO food. The same idiots would have been victims if the leadership did not carry out that campaign earlier. Their family members at home will also be victims. So, what am I trying to say? When leadership said, distance yourself, some people were, you know, being stupid in reaction. Today, what are we saying? IPO we said nobody should protest, but federal government is even doing everything to give a narrative that the protest is going to be organized by IPO. So we must be intelligent. We must be smart. Being smart is not vituperation. It's not opening your mouth and talk like a moron. The, 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 yes, uh, we do respect with the Palestinians. But let me say something. The reason why the Israelis seem to be advanced and holding everywhere is because they do more of less talking or more in intelligence gathering, wherever they find themselves. They gather intelligence for the survival of them as a nation. But talk, see our people. Our people can be, in fact, give them intelligence. They, 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 they trample on it like swine, like pigs. They can work with it. They can effectively maximize it. You see that you see them even jeopardizing that opportunity. Do you think our people in DSS don't wish to release information to us? Do you think our people in the army cannot share intel, intel with us? Do you think our people in the government house can, are not will not be trusted to share? But when you now see people who behave like children, when you see an amateur people, people who believe that it's noise making and empty, you know, talks is the order of the day. Then how will you expect such a person to risk himself? So for you to survive, for you to, you know, have a successful one, you must show some level of maturity and integrity. So when leadership said that most people were being skeptical and uh, disrespectful, but today is before our own eyes. Okay, imagine that there was no press statement distancing. Don't you think the narrative of this idiots would have been flying? So we must be smart and be knowledgeable. I sincerely appreciate your wonderful submissions. Still on the protest, you can now see that the protest is bringing this time around, is being championed by even some uh, media persons. And uh, you can see that the Igbos are still so much uh, aloof and incurious. But not just that alone. The surprising thing there is that Nigeria is being bowled over the way Ohaneze Ndibo. In the upcoming nationwide protest. So I now want to. Sorry, that was now do their actions now show that the job that the IPOB leadership is now is doing is now intensively sinking. Is it now intensively sinking? Uh, that uh, or is it now taking root that even the Ohanes and the now have to understand why a proactive why uh, we should be proactive. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I read on uh, Hanese's, uh, I read on uh, I read on Hanese's position, which is in tandem with uh, IPOB position when it comes to this protest. But let me say this also, Wanda uh, uh, Jupita. Let me let me add up something. You see, this idea we should we should understand some. We should be politically aligned. It's not every time, it's not everywhere. There are there are certain things we'll be pursuing. There are certain things that even when Onyendu was here, 
There are things Ohanese will do, he will commend them. He will give credence to that. Isn't it? So, it is. Any policy they come up with, or the governors come up with, that is enhancing, that is going to be for the good of our people, we should commend it. Then, just like check and balance, a watchdog activity, and where they air, we should also condemn as much as we can without sparing anyone. Because why am I saying this? For instance, when Abia State decided to go on the industrialization drive they are going, putting a lot of places better be. I feel be commended. Now in Imo State, for instance, we're also hearing the, the idea of abandon, you know, taking away EEDC, the, the destructive EEDC for a rush, power supply energy, is a welcome development. We cannot condemn it because we want our land to be industrialized. We want our land to be developed. Because if our land is developed, if our, our land is industrialized, we have no reason to see our people in Singapore prison, to have them in Ghana prison, to have them in prisons all over the world. That cannot happen. You understand what I'm saying? So, yeah. what am I when IPOB gave that reason, gave that press statement and said, let none of us identify with that protest. IPOB gave reason for that. That based on historical antecedents, whenever there is protest, they end up turning to homophobic agenda. And for that reason, besides, what are they protesting? They say to stop hunger. Is IPOB fighting to stop hunger in Nigeria? That is not the project. That is the that is not the reason for IPOB formation. That is not the reason why Namdekan is why the Namdekan is inside. We are not fighting for better Nigeria. We are fighting for dissolution of the British political hemisphere, so to say. Test running. That is what we are fighting. It's a clear objective. It's unambiguous. So telling our people to identify to, to fight for better sham, which is practically cannot be better, is a self-delusion and deception. Ohanes also came up and said, uh, their reason is because they don't want to stand against the local government or whatever. That is their reason. That is their own. But what is most important here, we must understand that anything we are doing, any policy we are marshalling at, should be for the enhancement of our people. And when we talk of our people here, is a collective now, is a collective identity we are talking about. We are talking to our people from all walks of life. We are talking of our people from all different political affiliations. Because people do not understand when we talk about IPOB is not standing to protect IPOB. Make no mistake about that. The sole reason why she is standing is to preserve our people. And those people you are preserving are those who even want their fry emergence and those who do not want it. They are your people. You get what I'm saying? So that yeah. is exactly what it is. So we must, because one thing that got me most time angry and uh, gave me ill feelings is that our people believe is when you talk expressly, when you talk, you know, unguidedly, when you, when you, when you are spilling out things, you, they, they think. They are communicating. They think they are exacting. No, 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 no. In most cases, you sit back, you analyze the issue, make plus, make minus, so that you can give the ideal policy that is workable. 
You can give the ideal opinion that is workable. You can give an ideal contribution that is not workable. Not you just come in, you want, you want to talk because you feel you must talk. Chen can poke mentality. Who cares? Because we are talking about national interest. That is all I can say. Since you are your back. Because of this um, net, uh, poor network issue, I would have wanted us to further because we had so many things to talk about, but um, maybe we use this uh, question to summarize it so that we come back when the network will be more stable. Now, when you look at some people's agenda, they will appear attractive or they appear that this uh, voice of reasoning still on this protest. Now that the presidential candidate of a African Action Congress, Omoye Lechore, is seizing this opportunity to champion release Mazen Nandekano now and demilitarize the Southeast. Majestin, don't you think, uh, don't you deem it fit that only this alone should make Ibos or IPOB to join in this proposed nationwide protest? Well, uh, I like I said earlier, if by this time we are not reasonable to to understand mind again, that means we should go home. We all should go home. For crying out loud, we are talking about 10 years, over 10 years process. If, I'm, if I've been schooling for the past 10 years, I should be approaching professorship. That is what it is. At least within four, four years, I get my first degree. Maybe another three years, which is, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, I get my master degree. Then I go for my PhD for four years again. So you see, if I have been studying for the past ten years, I should have I should have my PhD by now. I should, you know, have my doctorate degree. So how can you not tell me that a struggle of ten years we will not be able to governize to understand psychological manipulation, to understand mind game, and that is where our people are getting it wrong. You should ask yourself. You see, we made a mistake. People come and call Mazen the Mazen we, we, we gave them our listening ears. They infiltrated us. Remember, no one who has caused problem in this struggle that failed to call Mazen the that failed to call Biafra, that failed to call our DOD. They don't call opposite names. They call the names that when they mentioned it, you relax. When Fanny Kayode was infiltrating, what did he call? <laughs> I can count many, 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 many people. So if for the past 10 years we, we, we have been un, unable to deduce, to understand tricks, to understand mind games, to understand mental manipulation, I'm not saying Shawori is coming on that, but the truth remains. A matter as at which we are, we should have a zero tolerance to sentiment. When you're talking about security measure, preservation measure, protective measures, you don't soften your ground because your mother is the one holding God approaching you. You get what I'm saying? It must be yeah. an absolute, it must be an absolute measure to protect irrespective of whose identity is being projected. So nobody can come and say tomorrow just that one of the reasons for protesting is 
for the release of Mazen Nani. Then you crash your program in his mantra. Definitely you're going to cry. It's a question of time. You will cry. And heaven will be heaven. Earth will be earth. So we must be careful. We have experienced a lot to be loose guided. We have seen a lot to be foolish. We have passed through a lot to be extremely flexible and workable. So, Shawori might have good intention, but we are talking about the national movement. We should not be predictable. We should not be people that somebody will sit in his parlor discussing and say, don't mind them. If I just say this, they are going to join the bandwagon. If we get to that point, we are real. If we get to that point, what it means is that we are toddlers. And we shouldn't allow anybody to give us such demeaning identity or descriptions. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your wonderful submissions. If not because of the technical glitches, I would have loved us to further, but we will want to sum up and I will like to use this post on the Facebook account of Mazichina Samoru to round off uh, today's discussions. The post says, the consequences of Igbo youths joining upcoming protests. Historical context and current dynamics. The Igbo people of Nigeria have a rich history of activism and resilience. Dating back to their role in the country's struggle for independence today, Igbo youths continue to assert themselves in various spheres, advocating for political representation, economic empowerment, and social justice. Their, their participation in the, protest, in the protest often reflects broader concerns, such as government accountability, youth unemployment, and infrastructure development in the southeastern region. Potential impact on national discourse. The involvement of Igbo youth in upcoming protests could potentially trigger another massacre of Igbos in Lagos and other regions. This could foster a more robust national discourse on governance and socioeconomic policies that affect not just the Igbo community, but the entire nation. Socioeconomic implications. Economically, protests can disrupt business, business activities and impact investors' confidence potentially affecting the already fragile economy of Nigeria. However, the participation of Igbo youths could also draw attention to regional disparities in development and infrastructure, highlighting the need to tar targeted interventions to spur growth in the Southeast and other marginalized areas. Political ramifications. Politically, the involvement of Igbo youth in protests could be high could be hijacked. Pardon, please. Politically, the involvement of Igbo youth in protests could be hijacked by Nigerian government and paint Peter B as the sponsor of the protest. Challenges and opportunities. Why the participation of Igbo youth in protests presents opportunities for positive change. There are also challenges of to negative. Let me take it again, please. 
why the participation of Igbo youths in protests presents opportunities for positive change. There are also challenges to navigate. Ensuring that protests remain peaceful and constructive is crucial to maintaining public support and achieving meaningful outcomes. Additionally, addressing grievances through dialogue and institutional reforms is essential to translating protest energy into sustainable change. In summary, just like Maz Chika Austin has submitted, IPOB is not fighting for a better Nigeria, rather fighting for the solution of the country called Nigeria. So IPOB and Indibo are saying that we are not interested in this protest because how can you go and protest against a government that you did not vote to power? A government that in Lagos, we were disenfranchised. In the North, the Igbos were disenfranchised. Even in the East, we were disenfranchised in all regions. And now that they have brought Jagaban to the power, they want Igbos to come and participate. We have not forgotten the massacre that took place at Togate, at Lake Togate. And also, we, we have not forgotten that so many people that we are taking away in Obibo since 2020 because of Nigerian white nation protests, we have not forgotten them. So many of them are not yet back or integrated with their families. So many of them were disappeared. So many families and homes were destroyed because that very protest, the hashtag NSAS protest, was termed Igbo protest. So IPOB, Ohane Zendibo, and the Igbos in general are saying to Nigerians that we are not interested. We are fighting for the freedom of our people, for disintegration of Nigeria, and that has been our stand. And that continues to be our stand. We are saying thank you to IPOB leadership that is always proactive and always give a stand and always make themselves clear and distance ourselves from every violence and uh, every blackmailing by the Nigerian state or every attempt to blackmail IPOB or allow the infiltrators to continue blackmailing IPOB that the IPOB leadership has tried to make sure that as long as we fight for this movement, or for this uh, freedom of Biafra, that we remain as white as snow. Thank you, wonderful people of Biafra all over the world. And uh, wonderful viewers, we appreciate your time for being with us on Biafra Television. Wherever you are, around the globe, do not forget to download BTV, Biafra Television. It is app that you can download on your X, you can download on your X, you can download it on Instagram, you can download it on Facebook. Download BTV and let the message get across the world. Thank you for watching. I still remain Mwada Jovista Chichi. Good night.